Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Skiba. I'm the Executive Artistic Director for Cleveland Opera Theatre. And today on Page to Stage, we have Executive Director, Stage Director, Singing Actor, Voice Teacher Extraordinaire, Justin John Moniz, joining us from New York City. So welcome, Justin. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here. So you've, you've got a, a little bit of Hawaii going on in, in the shirt there. Yeah, some uh, flamingos here. I tried to uh, channel my aloha today uh, <laughs> here from New York City. And of course, um, reflecting on the fact that we won't get to spend the summer in paradise this year, but uh, certainly making plans, no less. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we'll talk about a number of things today, you know, on, on page to stage. Um, we've talked with many designers, uh, different artistic directors and general directors about, you know, what it takes to bring works literally from the page on paper and all the planning to, to the stage in production. So you're one who wears many hats. Um, one of those is the executive director for Hawaii Performing Arts Festival. So I know that you and your team have been putting some stuff together. Partially, I'm a, a member of that team, but uh, you had a great vision for some things uh, in, in terms of pivoting to a virtual festival. So could you talk about that a little bit and what is that and how did that come to be? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I should say that Hawaii Performing Arts Festival has been around for about 16 years and we are a training and performance festival on the big island of Hawaii. So the model for the festival, generally speaking, is uh, two or three operas and a musical, and that runs on our main stage. And so this year we were obviously faced with a really difficult task to make the decision to postpone to 2021. So we started putting our heads together and uh, thinking about alternatives. And so we came up with this idea of a virtual festival as many companies uh, are exploring now. And so we, we decided to devise this space theme as in the see you out there tagline uh, so that we would encourage people to join us in cyberspace essentially for uh, an interactive festival, which would run for two weeks and it would be able to engage people um, from both the Hawaii community and worldwide. And we would still be able to offer a training element to our participants whom we auditioned throughout uh, the last five or six months. So we've been working hard to, to mount that. And so the model we've taken is a bit of performance alternating with a masterclass. So we're emphasizing that uh, the training element every other day, essentially. And then even though we don't have um, public lessons and coachings, those will be private. We have the opportunity for folks to get an eye in on that process through these open masterclass forums and then a way for them to engage. So we're really excited about it. And we've um, done some really cool things in terms of that, especially uh, with the addition of our vocal competition, which is new this year. So any of our, I should say, contracted folks, contracted participants who were set to join us this year are able to enter that competition. And this whole festival is entirely tuition free. So we've tried to emphasize the accessibility element this year and to really reach people uh, worldwide and also those in the local community. That's awesome. That sounds great. It sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. It's a labor of love as, as many of these things tend to be, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so, you know, as, as an executive director, let's, let's take a look at maybe the many hats that you wear. Um, in bringing a work from, from concept to delivery, what are some of the things that that you do like what what does an executive director do for those who don't know or those who are, and those who are curious yeah maybe i should start by saying all the things and or <laughs> section e other duties as assigned it's mm -hmm. probably a good place to start uh but in terms of the planning process you know we're a little bit unique in that we are training and performance festivals so we have like local patrons who come to us every season we've had subscriptions over years past and we have a really loyal uh, base of folks who look to us as an opportunity uh, for high level performance uh, on this island in, in the South Pacific. And uh, while they have done an amazing job, the, the state of Hawaii, particularly with bringing in some incredible artists over the years, uh, the community has really developed um, a real connection to the cultivation of training. And so they have really supported us through thick and thin We've been really excited to be able to see this thing grow over the past 16 years. So when we program, when we think about, you know, the productions we're going to be mounting and the folks we're going to be bringing in, both in terms of our faculty artists and our students and our fellows, uh, you know, we're looking at a lot of different elements. Um, 
you know, most, most companies would sort of try to go with the model of what will sell. And while it's important to us to fill seats, that is such a small part of, of our revenue, right, as, as an organization. So we, we look less on that and we look more to the music education and the training side of it. So we're looking for things that are accessible for young singers to be able to sing, as well as those who are professional fellows. You know, our professional fellow program, as you know, uh, really caters to those who are going to be emerging and coming out of young artist programs. Maybe they're EMC candidates, uh, they're gonna be getting their equity card soon, or maybe they just have received their card. So this is an opportunity for them to come and put the, fi the finishing touches, if you will, on their product and, and come to work with us. So we try to appeal to all these audiences both local and international in terms of our of our student and participant base so that we can provide opportunities that are worthwhile to come uh, spend a summer in paradise. Yeah, that sounds great. It sounds like a, a good a good time. So as an executive director, you're looking at all the things essentially, you know, as, as you said, anything under the sun. When it comes to being a stage director, you know, how did you, know, you put that hat on and how do those duties differ? And maybe even especially if you're if you happen to be directing something within the festival, do you sort of have a, a dinner time argument with yourself about the money you want to spend but can't spend on a production? Like how does how does that all come into play? I think that argument is ongoing, certainly. <laughs> uh, but I will say, you know, it's a little different because you know when coming into it from a stage director's perspective, um, there's a bit more time spent with the nitty gritty. So like first and foremost, in terms of developing a concept for a particular production you know, read, read, and reread the libretti and, and or the script and, and, and look through these pieces in terms of identifying key themes, you know, seeing what will speak to the artist, what will speak to the audience, what will be relevant. You know, we've, we've made a charge uh, recently to try to explore operas and or new works that um, really speak and have uh, the ability to really create some social and lasting impact um, on the social community and social issues. So um, we have taken that into account as well. In terms of mounting something as a director and developing a concept for a particular piece once we've decided on it, um, you know, the question I ask myself is always, is that the strongest choice? You know, uh, I think a lot of directors, a lot of young directors and even directors trying to stand aside nowadays are trying to develop like things that haven't been done before and reinvent the wheel. And while that's pretty admirable, I think the thing we've got to come back to is the intention of the librettist and the composer. Mm -hmm. You know, if we start to lose sight of what the intention of the piece was, um, when we develop something new, um, you know, it can lose its impact in some ways. So I'm really a fan of, of trying to develop something relevant. I mean, that's kind of our, our goal here is to attract folks. And I think people will be more likely to be moved in a piece if they can relate to it, right? And they're more excited about it if they see something of themselves within the piece or within the challenges of those who are in that story. But I think more often than not, it's, is this the strongest possible choice? And will this speak to our audience? Will this be relevant to our artists? And, um, you know, how can we, how can we really sell this? Yeah. Now that's, that's, that's the, the million dollar question or sometimes the yeah. $5 question, depending on your budget. Absolutely. Uh, I'll drink to that. <laughs> I, I've got some coffee here. We can toast. Um, sure. so your th the third hat that you wear, your many as a, a singing actor, how does, how does the process for you bringing, bringing a role to life, either if it's something new that you have a hand in creating, or if it's something that is maybe in the first time with a role or even uh, an old friend that you've performed a number of times. How does, how does your process come together in that aspect of artistry? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I would say in some ways it, it sort of parallels my work as a stage director in terms of starting from that, that textual perspective and working out from there. I think so often too in opera and musical theater, we get so swept up by the music and it's a blessing and a curse because we need to first identify, you know, for the character anyway, what is the given circumstance for this character? And uh, part of what makes this interesting, I think, is to develop something that you know you can relate to as a storyteller. So finding a parallel uh, in terms of what works for you, and you know finding the highest stakes in any scenario to try to allow the the character and the piece to have great forward momentum and great energy, and there to be a great arc that's developed throughout the journey of that character. So I think it's it's work that. So, so many of us sort of 
breeze through, but it's really important to spend the time just as you would if you were directing the piece and, and have those decisions made, you know, going into the room, because then there's so much more of an opportunity to engage in a dialogue with the stage director, the music director, and really start to play. And uh, as you and I have had the opportunity to do that, um, you know, some of the greatest collaborations are a result of that preparation prior to coming into the room. So if my, myself, if I can, as a singing actor, you know, have my circumstances decided, have my scenario, you know, what's at stake, if I can be sure to have, you know, defined something as minute and as important as my beat changes heading into a rehearsal, um, there's just so much more of an ability to then say, oh, that didn't work, you know, that, that uh, beat wasn't, wasn't quite well timed or that that motivation didn't really give me what I needed, didn't read. So then we can really just explore and play a bit more. So I would say that it's a similar process to the stage director hat, but certainly a little bit more personal in terms of the individual's character work and what I can relate to, you know, as an actor. Yeah. And I would imagine too that the work, you know, the work you do as a director informs your work as an actor. The work you do as a executive director is informed by the experiences you've had as a director or actor. So they all work in a synergy that depending on which perspective you're taking gives you some unique insight that you can apply. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you couldn't have said it better than that. It's, it's, it's amazing to me now that I've stepped to the other side of the table as an administrator, you know, all the things like, oh, that's why that's done that way. Oh, now I get it, you know, and I just wish I could share more of this with folks, you know, who may not understand, you know, may not understand you know, I know there's been a lot of controversy, not to get controversial, but in terms no, please. of controversy is good. We'll get we'll, more likes. We'll get more comments, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, like but, us now if you don't like our Facebook page for Cleveland Opera Theater. We're about to talk about controversy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but there's been controversy in terms of like, you know, young artist programs and charging application fees. And that's been a hot topic for years. You mm -hmm. know, why in opera do we do that? But why in musical theater don't we? And I mean, this is a discussion that's its own, you know, page to stage webinar <laughs> for a later date. We'll have, but, we'll have a week long session on that. Yeah, yeah, but but in terms of you know being um, on a shoestring budget and, and being able to send people to New York, to send people to LA, to 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 face the overhead, you know, and to hire the pianist and all those things, I, I don't think anybody is is getting rich off this. I mean, that's certainly a, a given for most of us. Um, it's it's an opportunity to just cover the expense and allow the organization to stay afloat. Um, so yeah, coming to the other side of the table. Um, I just feel much more well informed. And I think my work as a singing actor has certainly informed my work as a director, which has then informed my work as an executive director who oversees, you know, that entire process and uh, all the people on my team. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe the, the final hat, certainly not the, the least important, but maybe the one that's arguably the most important and maybe the most informed as an educator, as a teacher you know, with, with your work at NYU and, you know, you've taught at various places and deliver master classes and clinics and things, but how does all of that come into focus? Because you've, I mean, you've, you've been teaching for a while, but as you've done more and more things as a, not only as a performer or a director and, and as an, an administrator, how does that come into focus in terms of how it augments your teaching? Yeah, I think, I think it heavily informs what I do as a pedagogue you know, both within the parameters of my studio and my classes. Um, one of the greatest things I think for students is to have the opportunity to work with folks who are still involved in, in their given profession and are immersed in their industry. Because what it does is it allows there to be a direct transfer of knowledge and information to what's happening currently. And uh, that's one of the biggest gifts I think I'm able to bring my students um, is to just give them a continuous stream of what's happening in the industry and the industry's trends and be able to prepare them for those challenges accordingly. Um, you know, there's a great emphasis nowadays on versatility and flexibility. And, you know, years ago, I say this because I trained as a classical artist, but, you know, have always done musical theater and have now balanced a career in both worlds. You know, there, there's no siloing anymore as there once were, was, you know. So the really interesting thing is that we um, start to see these trends, you know, musical theater being produced in opera houses, you know, site-specific opera that is being produced in a, a space that's not a proscenium theater. And suddenly we get into different tactics and, and different approaches that we need to prepare students to engage in. That's just so different than the traditional training model. Um, and and this is, these are some things that you and I have discussed, of course, but I think it's important to be able to have that dialogue with students and with colleagues and to be able to engage in, okay, what are the trends? 
what are our students being asked to do? And are we meeting that need here within the curricular model that we have in place? Right. And certainly everybody all over the world is dealing with the whole new set of challenges now and that, that acting for the camera, right? Acting for the camera, yeah. The the, <laughs> the non-siloed ultimate flexibility. Um, I've seen some pretty cool things you've done um, online with some of your classes um, at NYU. What what would you say are some of the discoveries that you've made? You know, I always try to find the silver lining in, in anything. That's my that's my default, and yeah. you know, not not under underplaying the challenges and the difficulty everybody's being faced with, but in that silver lining perspective, what are some things maybe that you've discovered that you, you otherwise wouldn't have tapped into? Well, one of the things I find that we've been forced to do is listen more closely and more critically, you know, um, especially because we have a little bit of lag here in technology that hopefully will eventually be, be rectified. But the idea is that, you know, we're really giving an ear and we're taking time to reflect. Whereas sometimes when we're in person, we're, we're too quick for our own ability even, you know, and it's just bam, 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 onto the next thing. We've got, you know, 60 minutes in the voice lesson, you know, the first three or four or five minutes is eaten up by getting, getting set up and, and saying, hello, how are you? So I think I felt less rushed and I certainly have felt the ability to be able to engage more uh, just in terms of active listening uh, without, any distractions or any racing of the clock. It's, it's been uh, really um, empowering, in fact. And the other thing I'll say about the technology, it's, it's allowed us to connect with folks that we never would have thought to connect with. I mean, in my graduate vocal pedagogy class at NYU, uh, I was able to bring in some incredible people. I mean, leading scholars in the field, authors of two of our books, um, people who are just so generous with their time, you know, with everything going on. And, you know, maybe otherwise wouldn't have been able to, to do that or wouldn't have been able to make it to campus from Houston and Boston. And so this really put things into perspective in terms of like, wow, you know, we can certainly do these things in different ways that we hadn't really explored before and they can be incredibly effective yeah. uh, just as they would in other, other ways. I don't think anything replaces in-person um, instruction or, or in-person, you know, interactions, but I certainly think that under the circumstance, I've been really thrilled with uh, with the students and with how people have been able to adapt and be, you know, continuing to be so generous with with their time and with their talents. Yeah, yeah, it's just to see that outpouring and everybody's willingness. I think part of it comes from such a desire to connect. You know, the the art form that we're all in is is dependent upon connecting. You know, and and right now we we can't really, but at least we're able to you know connect long distance with people that we might not have otherwise. And, you know, we're, I know we're all longing for the day when we can little by little get, get more live audiences and more participation. But I'm, I'm hopeful that some of the stuff we've discovered or explored or currently exploring will, will find their way to, you know, positively augment what we're doing, whether that's yeah. Yeah. technology into things or, you know, different absolutely. content. I think it will, Scott. And, and, you know, the truth is, I think we as artists, like it's in our DNA, like, we are resilient creatures. And I think if anybody can prevail through this, these challenging times, it's, it's gonna be the artistic population. I mean, we, we've done it before, we, we've conquered and we have overcome these challenges. Um, so I think if, if any community can find a way, it's certainly gonna be ours. I hope, I hope so. And it's, you know, what is it? Opera's been around for 400 plus years and dealt with nearly 130 epidemics, et cetera. So hopefully we'll, you know, come out of this one too. Yeah, um, I have faith. <laughs> me too. So in quarantine, I, you know, I've, I've been feeling bad because I'm seeing people reinvent themselves and learn complex things and master sourdough and they're right. they're all super ripped now. And so what have you been doing in quarantine to keep yourself busy? Have you developed a new talent? Or? I mean, I'd say probably like a lot of people, I've consumed many more carbs and sugars than probably, <laughs> you know, needed. <laughs> but with that being said, you know, here in New York City, it's it's sometimes difficult to escape the hustle and bustle. But uh, my partner Billy and I recently uh, bought bikes, and we've been biking uh, through all the boroughs and just seeing you know different parts of the city and and exploring things we never would have had time for right prior. What does that even mean? Time. It just starts to put everything into perspective in terms of what we can start to create time for. And I think that you know, again, to find the silver lining, at you, as you said this just forces all of us to just slow down a bit and, and to really, you know, 
hone in on what's important and to find and reconfigure for ourselves that balance. Yeah. You know, the balance of carbs to biking and, and, and so forth. And I just think that that's a really important thing that we, so many of us in, in this business especially have lost sight of because it's that continuing um, or the continuous hustle, I should say, that we just never lose sight of. So this has been in, in many ways, while frustrating, like really revitalizing and really refreshing. And though many of us who have taught, you know, since January without a spring break, because we had to transition all of our courses online, you know, though we're, though we're tired, I think in many ways, um, you know, as we've gotten to this point, there's a sense of satisfaction and, you know, we can do this. Yeah. Uh, that's been, that's been proven through the work we've accomplished uh, this semester and I'm, I'm sure beyond. So, yeah. And I, I think the, you know, the students too, I mean, I'm sure it's true with yours, you know, with, with mine at Baldwin Wallace, just seeing their resilience, you yeah. know, and just the, the ability to say, okay, this is completely different and we've not done it and this is weird, but let's do it. You know, let's, let's finish it strong and let's, let's be creative. And, you know, that, that's been inspiring, you know, any days that I thought, oh, how are we going to make this work? Well, they, they, they showed me how. So well, it's probably the most difficult uh, challenge to discover how to navigate was an ensemble that I, I lead at NYU. It's pop rock ensemble. You know, how do you rehearse a rock band, um, you know, in different states and different time zones and, and be able to put that together? And so we did. We, we coached with singers, you know, one on one. The band sat in on those coachings and then everyone recorded with a click track. And then we had a listening party each week and we were able to accomplish something great. And again, silver lining. Uh, a lot of these students who are musical theater majors have media now for their websites. They've got media for their reels. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great thing that none of us would have ever explored or been able to produce otherwise. So that sounds awesome. How about, uh, how about your dog chance? Is he enjoying having you home more? Yeah. Chance is loving it. I would say Dr. Puffles, the cat, uh, is, you know, I think he's ready for some alone time. Uh, you know, we haven't left in a while, but, but Chance, I mean, he's, he's right next to me 24-7 and he's living the dream. We go take out the trash, come back and he's crying. You know, it's, <laughs> oh, we left him, but we've been gone for what, you know, two or three minutes. Yeah. So it's funny. Well, that's great, man. Well, thanks for, thanks for taking time to, to join us. Thanks for all the great work that you're doing and thanks for giving us some insight into the you know, many different hats that you wear and, and how that all plays into the journey of bringing things to life from the page to the stage. And yeah, I think it's got, a, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and uh, if I may make one plug before please, I start, please do. Um, I wanted to encourage our, our listeners to check out uh, Hawaii Performing Arts Festival's virtual festival this summer, because it is free. It's, it's entirely free to the public. Registration will open on June 1st and anybody can go to our website to sign up. It's hawaiiperformingartsfestival.org. We're also on Instagram and Facebook, you know, follow us, like us, and you can be a part of the magic that will be happening this summer. We've got some amazing people joining us this year. Um, we also have some celebrity guest judges for our vocal competitions. And I mean, celebrities who will be uh, partaking in this. We're gonna be announcing those soon. So, you know, join in on, on the fun, vote in the competition for your audience favorites, which is gonna be a, a new part of this whole thing this year. And uh, hopefully we can continue the magic of uh, live performance and, um, you know, bringing people together through this art form. So I hope people will join us and uh, continue, you know, following their hearts through this time. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I know that what we learned in that competition, uh, I know we'll be borrowing some of those things. We had to, we had our gala and competition postponed here in Cleveland. So we're, you know, we're envisioning a virtual one as well. So. Cool. We'll get to see how we do with that, and I think, I think the one of the the master class that I'm teaching for for Hawaii is in the slot that our Friday evening master classes are. So I'm just gonna hopefully guide everybody's attention over who would have tuned in on uh, Cleveland Opera Theater to join oh, us uh, for yeah. half that night. I think it's July 17. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to your class as well. Yeah. Well, yours too. Well, thanks again, Justin. Thank you, everybody, right, for. Yeah. For watching, be sure to tune in uh, every weekday at 12.15 and also do uh, join us uh, this Friday evening at 6 p.m. Uh, for the next installment of our online masterclass. So thanks again, Justin. Thanks again, everybody. And uh, we will see you out there.